Hello and welcome. It's good to see you guys today. It's, uh, it's been unusual for the last few weeks. Of course, you know, we've, we've been preaching to an empty sanctuary, so it's good to see you. It's good to see some faces out there. It makes a little bit of a difference. But I want to welcome you. We're delighted to see you. And we know that as, as you're aware, in the process over the next few weeks, we're going to be going through some transition as we reopen. And this is the first step in that, as you already know. Um, as deacons and deacon families, um, you have uh, an opportunity this evening to record here on this Thursday evening, which will, uh, the video will be shown on Sunday morning, and so uh, everyone else will have the opportunity to see this. But I want to welcome you, glad you're here, and today we have the privilege of hearing in just a few moments uh, uh, from the scripture uh, sermon entitled, I am salt, I am light. And it's the second part of a message I started last week, and the text is Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. And my purpose in all this is for us to become more, more fervent in, in evangelism, for us to make sure that we take the privilege to share our faith and share the good news with the world around us. And I know it's been difficult for the congregation during this time of quarantine and shutdown and separation but I wanted to just give a little bit of information that uh, the leadership voted on on Sunday. The leadership of Mount Rest Baptist Church committed from the very beginning to abide by the recommendations set forth by the governor in regards to social distancing and crowd size. So to the best of our ability, we have upheld that decision. And as the governor goes through the various phases of reopening and the restrictions for crowd sizes are changed, we as a team have agreed to, sh uh, to a, have a soft or a slow opening to continue to ensure the safety of all members. And so that's where we're at this evening is the first, our first phase in that. And so on that note, I wanted to just once again uh, welcome you, let you know that this is a delight to see you. It's a joy to have you in the congregation today. Uh, Rick and Sherry have done a tremendous job. Nick and John have done a tremendous job over the course of the last few weeks to give you the opportunity just to have an opportunity to worship. And so I'm grateful to them. And so on that note, I want to take a moment just to uh, uh, have a prayer. And I want you to be prayerful as well as this is a new endeavor for all of us. It seems like a new endeavor at least. And so uh, as we look forward to this time today, that you'll be blessed by it. So if you would please bow your heads as we pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege we have today just to come back together for a time of worship. Lord, our, our body has, has ached because of the separation. People have longed for a time in which they could come together with their brothers and sisters in Christ. And what a privilege it is for us to worship. We pray that this evening, which will be Sunday morning, as those who listen and see and observe, Lord, that they will be encouraged by the message today. In this time of worship today, this time in which we come together and rejoice as a body of believers. Father, we look forward to the day when it will soon be upon us, Lord, in which we have the opportunity to unite as a full, a full body with everyone here. And so, Father, we pray that you bless this time, bless our singing, and bless the message we ask these things. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, amen. Okay, so this is the first time we've done this. We're going to try to sing without using hymn books. So as you see, we've got our words up here, and we've got a, my lovely assistant over here is going to be flipping through the words. So just bear with us as we work through this this first time and, uh, and do this. And I was sitting here thinking as the pastor was praying that we don't want the mask and the social distancing to distract from our worship. And this is, we're here to worship we're here to sing and praise the Lord, and as we think, let's try to focus on that part of it and not so much on the restrictions we have. And it would probably be a good idea if I turn my mic on. So uh, let's all stand together, and we'll sing, Lord, Reign in Me. Oh, uh -huh. 
Father in heaven, it is truly, it is truly as we hear today for the first time after a while, it is truly a privilege to be able to come into your house and to worship you. We've all got a little bit of an uh, idea of what it feels like to be restricted, to be able to not do things the way we've always liked to. And we just thank you that we do live in a country where we're free and we have the ability to assemble together and meet and praise you. And Lord, help us never to take that for granted. And we thank you for that. And Lord, as we, as we worship this morning, we just pray that uh, our focus would truly be on you and on your beauty and majesty and holiness and greatness. Lord, we also pray that you'd be with our pastor as he brings us the message and help us to concentrate and to uh, focus as he imparts knowledge from the Bible to us that will help us in our daily life. And we just thank you for his leadership and we pray that you'll be with us as we go through these uncharted waters over the next few weeks and help us to uh, be able to worship together without anybody being affected in a negative way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's look at, I don't have to say turn to that page, let's look at uh, the next song, which is Send the Light. Good to see you. It really is a delight to have you here with us uh, in, at this time. And it's like I said a few moments ago, it's just an unusual time for us in the life of our church and our nation. And um, as, we, as we prepare in this, these next few steps, uh, this next Sunday, the 17th, which will be Sunday morning, uh, we will have our videotape service. And on the 24th, we will uh, come together as a body of believers once again and in, in a limited sort of fashion, as you've seen the uh, instructions on the Facebook page and on the, on the website. And so uh, I would encourage you to read those. 
but that will take place on the 24th. And so I want to ask you, if you would please take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5. And we'll be looking at verses 13 through 16. And primarily, we will be looking at verses 14 through 16. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And may God bless the reading of his word. Now, like I said a few moments ago, last week I started out in this passage of Scripture and I asked a question, how do you describe yourself? How do you look at yourself? And I gave a few descriptors that you might be able to use. I used age, vocation, what entertainment you liked, what sports team you liked, and you could come up with any number of descriptors. But I also asked a very important question. Would you describe yourself the way that Jesus describes you? He described his disciples, his followers, as salt and light. And so as followers of Jesus Christ, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, and both convey this idea of engagement and interaction with the world around you. So I ask the question one more time, how do you describe yourself? When you look in the mirror, do you say, I am the salt of the earth, or I am the light of the world? If you describe yourself in this way, you make an acknowledgement of who you are in Christ and how Christ describes you. So do you see yourself as salt and light? If you do, it affects the way that you interact with the world. It's your pattern for living. It's your ethical pattern for living. It's your ethic. So what is your ethic? Do you have a Christian ethic? Webster's defines ethic as the principle of conduct governing an individual or a guiding philosophy. And so as a Christian, your guiding philosophy should answer the question, do I season like salt or do I shine like light? It's a fair question. After all, as a Christian, you're the salt of the earth and you're the light of the world. Now the Sermon on the Mount describes in a very practical way what the followers of Jesus should look like. So in essence, the entire Sermon on the Mount gives Christian ethics. It describes how you should live. And last week I said it was salt. And this week as we focus on this next text, we, we see that we focus on the trait of light. So Jesus tells you that you are the light of the world. So the Sermon on the Mount contains this key idea of Christian living, how the Christian life should be lived out. We must permeate society as agents of change, agents of redemption as we bring people to the Savior. Those who will make an impact with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Salt adds flavor to food, whereas light overcomes the darkness. Salt purifies and preserves, whereas light gives comfort and dispels the dark. You are both light and you're salt. But here as we talk about the fact that you are light, it's a potent description of who you are. And so we're intended to live this life and convey this life for others. We're to give this light to other individuals. So let's boldly share the light. Only one point today, and that's this point here. Jesus tells us to live like we are the light of the world. Now Jesus calls us, as we see here in this passage, in verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. And what that basically means is we're to share the light and we're to bear the light of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 8 says to walk as children of the light. Philippians 2, 15 says we are to shine as light. Our 
ethical pattern causes us to live like light and share it with the world around us. That is our mission. But the scripture says something else very interesting. The Bible tells us that God is light. In fact, in 1 John chapter 5, 1, verse 5, it reads this way. This is the message we heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from our sins, from all unrighteousness. So light, very clearly, is an attribute that belongs to God. It is his attribute. It is who he is. It defines him. It is a characteristic. It's a trait that defines him. Just like when we say God is holy or that he is righteous or that he's pure. So when we talk about the fact that he is light, light shows his perfection. And as we see ourselves under the, the lamp of his light, of his perfection, we see our own sinfulness. We see his perfection and we see our sinfulness. This passage in 1 John also tells us that we, as light, we congregate with more light. That is, light becomes stronger when it unites with other beams of light. I have a mag light flashlight at the house, and, and if you look at the front of it, it has like, like 12 LED lights. And if, you, if you, did, you were to take any one of them out, it would diminish it a little bit. But the point being this, that, that though that that flashlight is much more potent, much more powerful with all the lights and all the force and all the battery power coming out of it at one time. And together, we as a body of believers, we are much more formidable. We are much more forceful if we come together and share the light. Now, that doesn't take away from the fact that we're still individually called to share the light because we are the light. Jesus said, we're the light. So we, even though we may be an individual, even though we, in the singleness of what we're doing, may share the light, the light is the message of Jesus Christ. You see, light is sweet. Light is welcome. Unless, of course, you're up to no good. Then light's not a welcome commodity. In fact, if you were to take that statistic from, from the sheriff's department, you would find that more crime is committed in the darkness of night because it flees from the light. So in other words, this expression here, when we talk about the fact that God is light, it means that God is the source and measure of all that is true, all that is pure, and all that is holy. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said this. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. So God is light, and Jesus said that he is the light. In John chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus described the John, John the Baptist, who was arguably the greatest of all prophets. And this is what Jesus said about John the Baptist. Uh, he was not the light, but came to bear witness of the light. So here in Matthew... When Jesus says, you are the light of the world, it can be translated this way. You are like light that is needed by everyone in this world. Christians actively bear the light. Christians actively share their faith. That is a priority in our ministry. That is a priority in our lives. So our mission as light is to show people the way to God. Our task is is to introduce people to Jesus. Because Jesus said, you are light. That is your and my privilege and responsibility. Our mission is to share the light. You don't put a light under a table. You don't put it under a bushel. You don't hide it. You, you spread the light. So light described in this manner is a metaphor, and it's an, it, it describes an oil lamp in a home or a lamp that is on a post, but it always bears light. 
It was in every home. It was a common commodity. And you and I, in the same way, we're to be everywhere. Not in some exclusive place, but we're to be everywhere permeating society. We bear the light of Jesus Christ. You see, this picture here that Jesus is he's calling us this light. It's this picture in which you are going to the people and the world around you. You help people see God as if you were a light. Or people can see the way you are, who you are. And because of who you are, you lead them to Jesus Christ. You bear that light. And when I hear statements like that, I always wonder, am I leading anybody to the Lord? Is my life in such a way that people around want to see the radiance and they want to know what is going on and why I have hope? We bear the light. We are light for the world. We share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So since you are light, you bring illumination to the path. You see, the psalmist said it in this way, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so we accomplish this bearing and sharing the light as we tell the world and we proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. We bear the light. We deliver it to all the people of the world. You see, if the gospel of Jesus Christ is in you, you can't help but bear it. If Jesus Christ is in you, he just pours forth so that people know that there's something distinctly different about you. You are a light bearer. You carry the light. You see, you should be so filled with Jesus that you cannot contain the light. It is his light which we herald because he is the light of the world. So as light bearers, we shine and we bring light into the dark world. See, our light is spread through good works. Christians must let their good works shine before the rest of the world. And if we do so, it brings praise to the Lord. And people want to know what it is about us. So there's some sense in which we, we do good works. But John Stott says this, it is healthy to be reminded that believing, confessing, and teaching the truth are also good works, which give evidence of our regeneration by the Holy Spirit. We must not limit them to these. However, good works are works of love as well as of faith. They express not only our loyalty to God, but our care for fellow, our fellows as well. Indeed, the primary meaning of works must be practical and visible deeds of compassion. It is when people see these, that Jesus says they will glorify God for they embody the good news of his love which we proclaim. Without them, our gospel loses its credibility and our God his honor. Therefore, we need to make sure that as we teach, as we talk, and as we proclaim, we back it up with our actions. Our light is the proclamation of the good news. Therefore, you let the light shine as you preach, as you talk, as you share the gospel of Jesus Christ. This phrase, let your light shine, implies that it's a natural phenomenon. It just happens in an uncontrollable manner. Myra has some, um, uh, some flowers out in the garden, and there's one that we especially love. It's, it's lavender, and you can go by and you can smell the lavender occasionally. But, you know, if I want to smell like lavender, I go out there and I rub a little bit of that lavender on me. It's what you do. And if you want to spread the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ, you have to spend time with him and you have to know him. You have to be able to share. And the only way that you can really be the fragrance of Christ and share the good news is if you are connected to him. Otherwise, what you do in your good works are merely activities. I remember on, on no, a number of occasions... You know, sharing a message with the Rotary Clubs in, in the Columbia area. And they do a fabulous job, but they're, they're about benevolence and good things. We are about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is always the paramount mission as Christians to bear the light of Jesus Christ. It's not about the good works. It's about presenting the gospel to the world. That is our mission. Jesus said, 
You are the light of the world. We bear this truth with pure motives to bring honor to him. Not that people would see your good works and applaud you, but that you might bring honor and glory to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We, as we bear this light, we shine brightly. And the darker the hole, the brighter it looks. The other night, I was outside. It was dark. Imagine that getting dark here in the mountains. Here in Mountain Rest, which is one of the, arguably one of the darkest places uh, at night in, on the East Coast. And as I looked across the road, I don't know how many, you guys know as well as I do how far the distance was, but I saw this little, this little blip of light. You know what it was? It was a firefly or a lightning bug, if you prefer. And we had this discussion this morning about lightning bugs, and same idea as a moment ago with the, with the flashlight. Do you realize that if you, and you, remember, you may remember this as a kid, you'd go and you'd have this, this container, and you'd just pump as many lightning bugs as you could find in there, and you'd have almost a good enough light to, to read. That's because of just the, the fact that, that this light is so important. The brighter it is, the better it is. But even that tiny little speck that was across the road, you could see it. I remember once when, and I shared this story once, many, uh, when I first got here and after I shared it, Mac Moore says, I sure do love those military stories. <laughs> but I remember one time we were in desert warfare training and we were told to keep the light pollution down. And in fact, have none. And so... Here we were, we were, uh, was getting nightfall, and we were uh, setting up our little camp here, and I don't know how far away the other side of the, you know, the, the valley was. I don't know the distance, but it was a pretty good distance. It was not, it was not like from here to, uh, you know, across the road. It was, it was quite a distance, and I remember as nightfall came, and the darkness kind of set in, and you could hear the little critters scurrying around because of the darkness, Somebody way on the other side of the valley struck up a, a lighter. And it was, a, I would imagine it was at least a mile. And you could see that tiny little speck of a light at that distance. The point being this, the darker it is, the more abundant and more bright the light looks. And this world we're living in today is dark and depraved. And you have the only answer. You are the light. You bear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have the answer. Why are people suffering? Why are they having a difficult time now? Because there's no hope within them. What a, what a wonderful opportunity you have to bear the light. You see, we should shine brightly like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. It, if, as, we, as we look at the truth, we look at the evidence... It's very clear that this gospel message penetrates the world and the only ones who can't see are those who either willfully close their eyes or turn their back on the light because it becomes very obvious as we look around us what the truth is, who Jesus Christ is and the message that we bear. We shine brightly, we shine conspicuously, not, not like a, uh, on a hidden hill. In fact, as, as we see the description here, a city can't, set on a hill cannot be hidden. You see, if the light isn't noticed, it's because there's a smoldering wick. If people can't see the light, if it's not noticed, it may mean that the batteries are dead. Or it may mean that there's no electricity. But for us as Christians, it may mean that there's no light within us. So we need to make sure that if we have this light, we're sharing it with the world around us. You see, the city on a hill cannot be hid. And as one commentator put it, he said it this way, that is, it cannot remain unseen. People can easily see that city on a hill. And if that beacon of light, Jesus Christ is exuding from your life and is just pouring forth from your life, people see it in a radiant sort of manner. What is it that people can see easily? I, I like spy thrillers. 
and you probably have, lo- have watched some. But it's amazing to watch someone hide themselves in a manner in which they go undetected. We call them sleeper agents or secret agents. There are no secret agents in God's kingdom. In fact, the Bible tells us clearly that we are ambassadors for Christ. And everywhere we go, we stand up and we herald this message. We live it. If we're not proclaiming it, people know that there's something distinctly about us. We bear the message. People should easily see the light of Jesus in your life. Do they? Can a disciple be a disciple who conceals their lamp? Light must shine. A true disciple impacts people and thereby brings glory to the Heavenly Father. Light shines so it can be the, you know, for the benefit of others. It does not call attention to itself. If we make the light about us, we miss the very important point of our mandate. That's bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. As light, our good deeds will result in praise going to the Father if we display the light prominently for all to see. You are the light of the world, which people will see because you light the path. People can see their way to God because of your testimony, because of your life, because you proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. So my question, as I prepare to conclude, is how should we live? A follower of Jesus Christ or a disciple without good works is of no more value than flavorless salt or a concealed lamp. But a true disciple impacts people and thereby brings glory to the Heavenly Father. We should live with an attitude that we will light the way. We will bring people to Christ. If we look in the mirror and say that I am light or a bearer of the light, then we understand that our mission is to bring people to Jesus Christ. It's a high priority for the Christian to bear the light. See, Jesus explains that his disciples will influence the world in a tangible way. That's why he uses these descriptors. You are salt. You are light. So the question today is, are you being conspicuous as a Christian who bears the light? As light, we must be ourselves, one true Christian, our one true Christian selves, openly living a life that's described in this passage of Scripture, not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Then people will see our good works, they will see our lives, and then they will glorify God. And since we are light, we are distinctly different from the world, just like night and day. We're distinctly different. See, the ethical transformation demanded by Jesus Christ is obvious to all who see your life, all who hear the message, all who witness the transformation. See, the Sermon on the Mount is built on this assumption that Christians are different, and it calls us to be different individuals, different than the world. The characterization of salt It stresses the church's universal mission. Jesus' disciples have a role to perform in this world. And Christ has graciously given us the ability to do it. We must share the gospel. Disciples like salt must mingle with the world in order to give it good flavor. Disciples like light must bear the light and show the world the darkness. So how should we live? The entire world, the entire earth must be salted, and the entire earth must be illumined. And this gives us our marching orders. This is the demand of the Christian life. We must bear the light because we are the light of the world. We should live boldly, knowing that we have a mandate from God to live pure lives. So this morning, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's the light of the world. He's transformative. He's cha- he, cha- he can change you. It's time to put your hope and your trust in Him. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we should live life in a way that we influence others for eternity. So this morning, as we close in just a moment, I'm going to ask you just where you're at. I thought about doing what they do in some of those other churches where they say, You're salt and you're lightened, but I don't want you to do that. What I want you to do is I want you to think about this. 
I want you to remember that you are salt, you are light, and you are designed and you're called, you're equipped, and your, your marching orders are to make an impact in this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are the only ones who have the message. You, as the disciples, the followers of Jesus Christ, won't you, won't you do that? Won't you make a decision today to live like light? If you would, please, bow your heads as we pray, and we'll have just a, just a moment. One more thing. Father, we just pray that you'd help us as we conclude this part of our service to remember that you've called us to be salt and light. Father, that you have empowered us and you've given us this mission to be light in this dark world. We are bearers of the light. That flicker of hope that we have that burns in our life it's for the world around us. Help us, Father, to bear the light. Pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. And today as we conclude, I want you to know if you need to talk to me, please feel free to contact me. You can call me at church. You can call me at home. You can call me on my cell phone. You can send me an email. You can text me. Whatever you need to do, if you need to get in touch with me, if you need to share something that's going on in your life.